I don't think I've not moved around with around too much, which might be quite difficult for me. So, so please shout, please shout at the boat. If I start one stuff, I might forget. Um, um, I'd just like to start by thanking, thanking um, Koichi and, and, and um, I believe Dominic as well um, on the marketing program committee for inviting me here today. It's a privilege, the first time I've um, had the privilege of speaking at the ACCJ, having attended many events myself. So um, thank you to them and also thank you to, to you all um, to coming today. Um, I hope, I'm sure it's, um, most of you here are sort of vested in this topic in some way. Um, it'd be actually quite interesting just to see in, as an audience, it's always good for an audience to be sort of self-aware in some way. How many of you are sort of working in, um, what you, you work in a, in a brand, let's say a B2C brand, and, and some of the decisions that you make affect how that brand is perceived? Could you just raise your hands? Okay. I see the recruiters looking around now. Um, <laughs> Um, and on the other side, maybe on the B2B side, um, how many of you are, or it would be the, having the equivalent on the B2B B2 brand or corporation? Okay, it's probably just not quite half and half there. Um, and anyone working sort of like me in, in the communications industry itself? Okay, so the rest are recruiters and you're welcome <laughs> too. <laughs> um, so. Um, how did I get here? I just I think it's always good to set up a bit of context. Um, this is the sort of the short version which Koichi alluded to. Um, so I, I write a blog at jamesholler.com. You know I have a, f a few followers, and um, I like to think about I like to think of blogging as a sort of healthy thing to do to, to think aloud. Um, there's not always that much opportunity to to sort of communicate and have sort of deep conversations about what it is we do. Um, so you can imagine my terror when I found out that people were actually reading it. Um, and then invited me to come and speak about it and, oh my God, actually answer questions about what I'd, I'd written. Um, so it's, it's a, a bit of a scary um, opportunity, but at the same time, I do, I, I do sort of back the ideas that I'm putting online. And I think today it'd be great if um, we could have a really healthy, sort of exciting Q&A discussion. So I will endeavor to wrap up the speech in about 20, 25 minutes so that we can have a good time for discussions. Please do ask difficult questions. I also invite other people who, if I can't answer them, if anyone wants to have a go answering them, because we're all kind of part of this, I think. Um, so the, the longer, longer answer to how I got here um, is this sort of timeline for, for me um, as a professional in, in the communications industry. Um, so I actually studied physics at university, but was recruited by WPP um, into their fellowship program, um, which is a program essentially devised to, to nurture sort of left brain, right brain strategy talent. Um, and the idea is you go into different um, sort of silos within the industry, because increasingly, or you know, for quite a while now, you end up in either PR and you st stay in PR, and um, you end up in, in, say, maybe digital and you stay in digital, and increasingly brands need more of a holistic viewpoint and getting advice from that viewpoint. Um, the problem is though, you, you get that training, but then the, job that's, the jobs that are there for you after those three years, for instance, the ones that are available in, in WPP companies in Japan, when I sort of graduated from that program after three years, are in those silos. Uh, so it, you, it's a bit frustrating, and in my case, I, I sort of, uh, I love Japan, did not fancy a career in, in those agencies here, so set up my own company called Alien Eye. And we were really focused on actually making content for digital at, at the start. And we kind of grew into becoming a, a sort of a, a digital agency, um, a strategic boutique focused on sort of digital new media. So I've, that, along that path, I've worked in and with the big Western agencies that Coach Sam mentioned, um, as well as the big Japanese agencies as well. And from, but worked with them and, and obviously, but from an outside perspective. And, oops. So I think that's been, um, that's very much helped me in come to some of the conclusions that I've made. It may be harder to, to, to see them so objectively from, from within. Um, so then Alien and I, just to, to tie the knot on that, I um, sold Alien and I to Prefero last year, which is the, at the time the biggest independent digital network globally. Um, but a lot of the big ones have been picked off already by the WPPs and Omnicoms. Um, and we were then acquired by Loan Partners. So this year we became Low Prefero. Um, we're basically a, a digital agency, but um, I, on the blog I like to talk about 
communications in general and some of the deeper areas, um, the sort of deeper thinking around that. And hopefully that's what I'm going to touch on and, and create some debate and stimulus here. Just, I think, to point out this slide, I've worked also with a lot of big brands. You can see sort of on the right at the top, but lots of little startups as well. A lot of my sort of friends and peers make, have made digital startups um, in various segments. And I think what you get with that is actually a, a model, a business model that starts and finishes online. And they've never contemplated use, using TV. Um, maybe when they get bigger, like the lines and the grease, et cetera, they might do. But um, we've worked across that spectrum as well. So that's it's given us a very sort of diverse perspective on this field. Um, so to kind of get into the, the sort of more sort of philosophical territory, I guess, um, has anyone heard of the, the, this um, book called Beyond Culture? by Hall, um, about, which essentially explores this idea of high context cultures. Anyone come across that? Yeah, so I think it's, it's been very helpful to me in sort of understanding how, what makes Japan quite unique. Um, so if, I'll start with the opposite extreme, like a culture, say New York, which is full of, um, it's very multicultural, people come from different backgrounds, people arrive from different places within, um, within America there. And it's basically, it has to be a high content culture. If you're not saying who you are, what you do, what you're trying to achieve, like in the first sentence, you, you're going to get sort of, sort of uh, washed out, essentially. So people are much more explicit about what they want, um, and the context is, is changing all the time. It's certainly not fixed. Japan would be more, you know, as, as a sort of generalization, the opposite to that, where it's more homogenous, um, as it's written up here, um, the, Words, words and word choices become very important because you're part of this in crowd that's kind of fairly homogenous. In, in, in the case of media, um, that plays out. Most people have absorbed the same media. You know, terrestrial TV has, uh, we've, you know, has still remained stronger here than it does in other markets. And you've seen less frag fragmentation. So even in media terms, it's a more hom homogenous culture and society. Um, and this idea, I'm going to keep coming back to this idea of context because it's really... I think um, it's really what you have to keep in mind when you're designing communications and when you're trying to essentially take opportunities to talk to your target um, and build communications. You have to be aware of, target, of, of the context more than ever before. Um, an example of this um, would be Line. H how many Line users do we have here today? Okay, yeah, so it's quite funny that when, when our colleagues come from, from the US or, or the other parts of the network, we show them Line and they say, yeah, it's like WhatsApp, I get it. And then you show them the stamps, and they're like, oh my god, these stamps are so, so fun, they're so exciting, and it really sells it. And it, it's a good example of this context. So, you know, a lot of the communication between Japanese peers uses stamps actually as these sort of, low, actually, in, in a high context context, where, for instance, if, if you imagine a group of, uh, you know, a generation that grew up um, reading the same manga series when they were teenagers. And there's a scene from that manga series where the protagonist kind of um, is faced with this terrible sort of catastrophe and it's a kind of, oh my God, what, what's going what's gonna to happen? And it's a very famous scene from that manga. That manga is, that's, that sort of scene is part of a stamp gallery that's sold on the platform. And then if you were communicating with your friends, you would use this stamp if you wanted to communicate your shock and horror about something. And everyone instantly, without reading any words, just from that one scene, knows exactly how you feel. And that's an example of this sort of high context culture. And I think it's one of the reasons that it feels to sort of creative directors in, in advertising agencies who come in and fly in from Europe and America, that they sort of don't ever get their head around that context. Um, and that's what makes it so sort of baffling to them and, and why they, they can't design communications that win can awards and things like that. So just sort of going back to um, sort of my st it's the start of my journey in this industry. I came in, um, I guess, to Japan in the end of 2002, having been working in a year in London in uh, Ogilvy and Mather in above the line planning. Um, and really at that time, you know, if you look at the top two on that list of um, media, it was really still all about TV, print, you know, out of home, and the, the web was, was a sort of this interesting area. Um, and it, it was more, a lot more money in actually um, CRM, digital CRM back then. That was sort of the, the big, the initial driver of digital. Um, and, but now if you sort of fast forward through the last sort of, say, 15 years, I guess, since the web really emerged, 
it's become so much more fragmented that so my team of you know we've got about you know 16 18 people working on stuff day to day and we have to we have to deal with all these different channels which means we have to have experts in them so that context we used to be fairly consistent for those big agencies working on tv print you know basically it's not changing that much the the, the way they're absorbed the perspective people have on them you know the the role of the medium in their lives but now if you Today we have, you know, search, display, which can either be sort of content match or interest match, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Line, Instagram, you have social retargeting opportunities, native ads, so all these different approaches and medium, and none of them are anywhere as big as TV on their own, but adding, you know, when you add them all up, actually they're in some cases more important than TV, for depending on the brand. So it's a lot more challenging. Um, there are lots more contexts you have to design for, and how do you do that? I mean, it's a really, I think, one of the biggest issues that um, companies face today and actually why the recruiters in this room are so important is how do we solve the people challenge to meet this? Um, how do we design a team to, to sort of face the communication challenges among brands? It's really important. I also just sort of, it's not just about the, the channels. It's about the, sort of the, the layers of culture that have built up on that. So I like to, when, I, when we were sort of first setting up Alien Eye, the business model, I mean, we, we didn't really have a good, business model to be honest uh, um, but we, we very quite early on we met a, um, a guy he was uh, we were making a corporate video for money and um, that he, he was a professional he was an academic essentially a sociologist studying the internet in Japan that was his thesis and um, this was about 2002 2003 and I said so you know this was our, we were trying to build a business essentially for you know on, online as our platform and he's like oh you should give up like, no why well, it's like the gutter of Japanese sign. It's like, you know, everything that people, all the dirty thoughts people have in their heads but, but can't say in polite society, they write online. And, and that was actually, if you looked at it mathematically or sort of statistically, most of, the, most of the activity online at that time was in Nichanel, Nichan. And it was, you know, it was basically everything that, you couldn't slag off politicians in public, so you did it there. You couldn't slag off your boss, you know, unless it's in the smoking room or, you know, so you did it there. So all of this, you know, that's what it, actually what it was. So it was this kind of like, you know, it, the netta, the, the topics were the, the darker side of the Japanese brain. Um, and that was, that was quite different from, from other markets, other cultures at that point. And then, you know, the, the, port, the main sort of digital media was the portal play. It was Yahoo. Yahoo was about 50% of the Japanese internet at one point. Um, and then if you look, you've added on to that, you've had the sort of the web mail, mail boom where everyone gets their, their own web mail account, You've got those early SNS platforms. So Mixi was a huge, it was a huge change for us. Um, so we, you know, as Ali and I, we were making content, but there was not a platform that you could originate, you could originate content on that could be propagated just by users without sort of basically paying some big corporation or carrier or someone. Um, it, it was owned by the structures, the community structures were curated by the users. It was really, for the first time, their medium, our medium, and that had a huge difference. Um, and what that what that did is allow them to create actually not only their own content but their own um, celebrities. So you had this sort of, and I, in some ways, I think the definition of a of a medium is when it comes of age is when it creates its own celebrities. Um, and if you look at say YouTube now, why it's such a healthy struck sort of culture, and I think a lot say will have a lot a lot longer life than Facebook is because. It's, it has a very healthy community and, and sort of culture for creating its celebrities and rewarding them. And so there's, a very, there's a very healthy ecosystem there. There isn't, I don't think, on Facebook, but it's kind of a different point. Um, but then, so with, with things like that, the, uh, the ability to kind of create the anti-heroes to the mainstream media um, on, on TV is a really important sort of aspect of that culture that you can play off. So uh, a campaign that we did for um, Die Hard 4.0 back in sort of I think 2007, we we create we we found a impersonator of Bruce Willis called Pucci Bruce, and we basically set him up as a as the kind of anti-hero to the Hollywood celebrity, and we made videos we made videos for this um for this guy which we just essentially recreated famous scenes from Die Hards 1 to 3. And there was, a, there was a genre of YouTube on, on YouTube called Homage, which basically was people who love films remaking 
their favorite scenes with them as the protagonist. And that's what we, we just made that, that with him as the protagonist. And his, his impersonations were useless. Um, but that was kind of the point, and everyone loved him for it. And our client at Fox was kind of like, I don't see what's funny. And we're like, there's not supposed to be some sort of ha-ha or ironic gag in this, um, which we're setting up a character and a personality, and we had a story arc where he, in, he tried to get to meet Bruce Willis. And it went so well that at this time, when Bruce Willis came over for the premiere, he was the number one ranked celebrity blogger in Japan. But he was refused entry to that premiere, even though they'd invited 100 bloggers to come to the event. And this, his, his, uh, his sort of really um, sad, depressed um, blog entry, which we ghost wrote, of course, got read out on these, fam on these big terrestrial um, Warai Bangami um, TV shows, and with huge ratings. This guy became a sort of celebrity overnight, and we had people on Mixie saying, you're the real Bruce Willis. Um, <laughs> and so that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't sort of realized that, you know, the, the, the web at that time was a place where you could, it was kind of the antithesis of the, the, um, the mass commi, the mainstream media that was essentially co-opted by the, by the big publishers, the, the big agencies and the big TV companies. So, and that's these kind of uh, cultural epochs have been have built up as layers on the web and you can still sort of tap into those sentiments if you're, if you're clever. Um, but they're all different. I'll sort of skip ahead to Line, which we've already covered. You kind of, we had Omnichannel, where lines, where the internet kind of got, you, you know, you would be, you really have to think about how you can join the web up to offline stuff, and that's still true today. Um, the social graph, I think we're kind of in the era of the social graph right now, where, you know, Facebook lets you, as, as marketers, sort of tap into the data of, of its users and use that to, to communicate with them in a more informed way. Um, we're probably at the peak of that right now. I think you'd argue that Line, this sort of the chat app era, is, is where we're at now. Um, I don't think Line is it's probably peaked in terms of its user growth here. I don't think it's, it's certainly not peaked in terms of the tools it offers for brands to, to build relationships on that platform yet, um, but they will come. I think we're starting to see that the, the start of the Internet of Things, it's something the ACCJ have been very, very much aware of. Devices, essentially, which measure your health, your sleep, all these things, and sort of turn your, your sort of you know, your personal narrative into data that can help you live, live by. Um, so, obviously, we're going to see a continuation of this, of this fragmentation and this evolution of these sort of uh, cultures and, con and contexts, but it's another layer that you sort of have to be aware of when you're designing communications. And, you know, what we, we're faced with this every day. We have to design for all these different contexts, and it's very hard, you know, we, you know when we work with the big agencies that were referred to earlier, they sort of struggle in a different way. Um, but you know we have these challenges. How do we make, how do we cover all these different channels? And so so going back to basics, this was the kind of um, the theory, as it were, that I was sort of trained on. In my you know I worked in London in my first year and I was coming out of quite an academic background, very keen to learn. I went to a the, the uh, account planning group um, lecture series and took an exam about it. So you know the account the planning as a sort of discipline is very advanced in, in London. Um, and the sort of forefathers of this, of this sort of uh, philosophy or this, this science, as it were, um, are these uh, people like Pollitt, Pollitt and Stephen King. Um, Stephen King was the head of strategy or the head of the, pl of the planning group in JWT in the 60s and 70s in London. Um, and the head of the creative department at the time, who was a close friend of his and sort of actually probably, you know, He's one of the, the, the last sort of surviving guru of that era, a guy called Jeremy Bulmore, was my mentor at WPP. So I've been able to sort of tap into to his perspective on these ideas as well recently. And I, but I think, you know, if, if you want to summarize essentially this philosophy or what I learned about it uh, from that and what, I, you know, we still basically apply today and I see being applied by those, particularly the Western agencies, is, well, essentially exclusively the Western nations here, is this kind of formula. If you, you find something unique about the brand that's, that you, know, you can only say about that brand that makes it special, and then find something about the target audience that makes them unique and um, you know, interesting as a target. And then you sort of, being aware of both of those, come up with some idea that um, sort of links them together. And we usually call this the, the communication concept. And then that gets turned into a sort of an executional idea. So I just want to give an example of that. Um, does, anyone, does anyone know this brand? 
Is it an exclusively English brand? It's only, this is kind of, if you, this is where we get to weed out the Brits. This is an American event. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, okay. So, so the, I guess if we kind of reverse engineer the, the, the thinking around this, this communication or, or back rationalize, as we say in, in our trade, um, the, the thing that's unique about the product is that it's, it's a chocolate, it's, it's a confectionery, but it's, it's broken up into little capsules of chocolate with gooey caramel inside. It's one of those ones that you, when, when you've lived in Japan long enough, you go back to the UK and you're like, oh my God, this is so sweet. <laughs> How did I ever eat this? Because we've been eating too much tofu. And... But, um, you know, the, what's unique about it is because it's in chunks, you can share it. So it has this sort of social notes of, you know, valency to it as a, as a product, which makes it unique amongst chocolate bars. Um, and, then what, and then, so what's the insight about the user, you know, in the context of consuming it? Well, do I share it or not? Is that kind of, do I want to share it? And I think, I suspect that the communication concept was, it's so tasty you don't want to share it. Something like that, right? But then some very brilliant creative made this leap to this idea of, who, you know, do you, do you love someone enough to share your last Rolo? And that, that as, a, as a communication concept, has run, I think, for about 20 years now. It's still going strong. So much so that they've just left, they can leave off the second half of it now, in the, like in this communication, because everyone knows it. And, and it's, it transformed the sales of this. I mean, it went from being a sort of a, an also ran on the confectionery shelf to just, you know, being a top seller, just, you know, runaway success with sales. And it turned the creative director who came up with the idea into a hero and he won a can award and all this sort of stuff. So in, in, that, in that sort of culture of coming up, trying to come up with awards, this is what those creative directors that Koichi referred to have in mind. They want to make one of these types of campaigns that actually sort of redefines the success of the brand, the role of the brand in society, what it means to users. And this, this is the power of advertising. This is what you can do. You can actually take sale, you know, all those factors like shelf space, like re retail trade relationships, um, how much money, you've, how many tarps you can buy, you know, it all goes out the window if you come up with one of these ideas. And that's what all these creative directors who've come over here and, and the Japanese ones who sort of are part of that way of thinking are trying to achieve. Um, but you see very few of them in Japan. And that's kind of, I guess, a long way of defining the, you know, the question which I attempted to answer in this, this blog article. Before I go there, you know, let's, this, um, it's worth sort of pointing out that this planning model has been the sort of platform upon which the Western agencies have built an enormously successful empire globally. So, you know, essentially, mainly American and British-based agencies, publicists are in there as well, have gone across the world and totally dominated. And you could explain this in lots of ways, but I'd argue that a really important factor is that they have this structure um, of building, essentially, trust and credibility with the client around the ideas that they're going to... The clients, they're asking the client to put 50 million dollars behind or whatever it is. And that, that sort of structure um, is, you know, it's really, it's really smart because it combines both rational and creative thought. It's a, essentially a rational approach, a rational process, which creative people can be part of and contribute to. And, and, and so it's not just a sort of, it, it takes in many ways the subjectivity out of that process in a way that's really important for, you know, when you're talking about lots of money and risk averse corporate culture and that kind of stuff. Um, and I don't think that model, it basically that model is not applied in Japan, in Japanese agencies. It's not the de default model. And it's not, it, it's not, it doesn't underpin the narratives between agencies and clients. And yet, the Japanese agencies are still so strong here. So, you know, Dentsu have 25% of the industry, you know, the others are all pretty much Japanese. You know, the, the foreign agencies that say in China, which is, you could argue, just as culturally, and, you know, sort of unique, um, the, the Western agencies have probably it would be the opposite way around. They have the lion's share. So, how did this? How did it end up by like this? So, to try and explain it, I'm going to go back to an ad from about I think 2003, and um, I think it's, it's sort of around from around the time that myself and Dicky, my co-founder, Alien and I were really trying to decode communications in, in Japan and, and how the TV culture worked in particular, um, and. I th you know, basically, I think this ad still represents pretty much the default approach to, ad to making ads in Japan.
ってね「ボス決して私」「見捨てないでお願い」Does anyone remember that, by the way? No? That's my point. <laughs> so, I, the, you know, one of the reasons that you don't remember, I, I remember commercials from, from my childhood, lots of them, because they stick in your mind. They have these concepts which are designed to sort of plug in and, and not leave. Whereas these ones are designed to be part of the zeitgeist of the moment, I believe. I don't think they're trying to be memorable. I think that they're, they're basically trying to explore the next area of culture. That positions that brand just on the sort of, you know, the, the next area of the zeitgeisty culture、um, that makes the brand relevant and part of Japanese society in that sort of holistic or、um, inclusive way.、Um, and in that sense, they're more about aesthetics, I think, than about concepts. It's more about. Getting you know, it's the right talent, for instance. What talent is just on the way up, hasn't peaked, kind of, you know, has the right kind of background for the brand? What, what music track, you know, potentially this is a bit different, but you know, probably had the right mix of English and Japanese in this.、Um, and this one, but I also just, it's interesting, on a, I think, a, as a sort of collage of aesthetics and cultural references. So, any what. what Did anyone get why there's, they're on a spaghetti western set? Why Hamasaki Ayumi is dressed up as a cowgirl? Why, why there's a Mifune look alike from the Kurosawa sort of you know, Jinbocha type films? What, what's going on there? So, you know, we're looking at this thinking. So, I think what's, what's in the director's mind is that. So, if you look back, Kurosawa was. was he, he basically. His format for movies was copied by the spaghetti western filmmakers in America. Um, and so that's why you have the, the Mifune samurai look alike and on a spaghetti western set. And then you have、um, Akebona, the sumo wrestler, as a huge, as a huge cowboy. <laughs> and, you have, and you have the sort of most petite cowgirl in, in Hamasaka Yumi. And I think they're just there to, as sort of just visual counterpoints, you know, the, the contrast in scale.、Um, and then they're singing this western song in, in Japanese. And then you have the Kono sisters there, who are basically sort of high class. Escorts.、Um, <laughs> but, but they're dressed as nuns.、Uh, so don't tell me that Western that Japanese advertising is not interesting. There's so, some of them, there's so much going on that it's never going to win a can, but it's doing the job of positioning that brand as, as something that's in, doing something interesting in this cultural, in this cultural mix, and which is evolving all the time on a more of an aesthetic level than. Than I think could be said for, for Western markets.、Um, and also, a special mention for copywriters in Japan. So, because of, because of the language here, you can write stuff in four different ways, at least, right? You can write it in the sort of traditional kanji based way. You can, you, can turn, you can write it in hiragana. You can use a,、um, a foreign word、um, and, and use that in hiragana. Or you can find an old Japanese word and write it in English. So, you know, you, you can actually find all these creative spaces. Um, to explore new ideas just within typography and, and, and use of copy、um, that's in, totally impossible in other languages. And a lot of the campaigns actually start and finish with exploring that space only. They're never going to win cans either.、Um, so that's, I think, this is a, you know, it is a really rich area, but it's rich in a different way. It's less about trying to come up with a concept that sort of. Hits the, use, hits the viewer over the head and sticks in their brain. It's kind of carrying them along and helping them feel like this brand is part of the current and exploring a little bit of the next.、Um, and so novelty is really important in that. And I think Japan is really hooked on novelty. And it's, you know, it's chicken and egg. Is, does Japan like consume, does it love product innovation because there's such a sort of inherent hunger for products? Or is it that's just how the, the, mar- the, kind of the, the market has been trained by the Companies that make those products and the channels that promote them.、Um, and I think it's a bit of both.、Um, but I think the, the, there's a really big point to make here is that although Hamasaki Imi is a bit different because she's an AVEX artist, the TV basically makes its own celebrities. And that's 
that's become increasingly true actually in the West with the emergence of like reality TV shows, um, talent shows, things like that. All those formats have been in Japan for a long time. So in a way, the West is, the Western TV, I think, has become much more, much more like Japanese, Japanese TV um, recently. Those, t those, TV ta those talents which TV creates, um, they go into the adverts. They're used in the adverts. So the, who, who, the, who, who basically sponsors the adverts? The brands that sponsor the TV shows. So you have this kind of closed ecosystem um, where, where you have the TV, the TV make the TV shows make the sorry the TV companies make the programs. Um, the brands sponsor the programs. The programs create the talent, and then the brands buy the talent. And it's a it's a very sort of convenient closed world. And in this world, if you were if you were a, a big company trying to basically lock down the market, you become you become dominant. How do you lock it down? Well, the worst thing you the last thing you want to do is compete on creative talent. Create on, compete on creative ideas because you can't control that. It's subjective. You, you know that could that power could be removed from you quite quickly. So what Densu's, Densu and Hakahoden like they do, they they've locked down the market by selling access to talent. So I think you know if, if you look at why is Densu so strong here, you know it, it's usually people say the answer is well they just they they have all these um, exclusive relationships with the the media sellers. You know, they own the media. But I think it's I think it's at least as as much to do with owning the talent. It's this kind of basically self consistent world of, of access to talent, and the easiest way for them to control the market is to auction off access to talent, because talent is the easiest way to create novelty for a brand. So it's basically I think lazy 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 marketing on the whole, um, but it's brilliant business, so clever. It's the best. It's the most simple way to basically lock down lock down industry. And, and that's why, because of that sort of system, you have then this, this push towards, you know, essentially exploring aesthetics rather than concepts. Because, you know, what, what basically happened in the West is the advertising agencies and the media agencies diverged and split. They used to be part of the same company. They split. And then that made all the creative agencies compete on creativity, which is a really hard thing to sort of sustain. It's culture-based. It's talent-based. You, you know, you, you can't keep it for decades. And so you have all these, you know, it's much more messy. Mergers and acquisitions, companies disappear um, because they basically didn't find a way of locking down the market. They were more interested in actually doing good work. Um, so in that way, Dense is just a much smarter business model, albeit, you know, I don't think necessarily the, an inspiring one to work for if you're a creative person. Um, that said, um, I think there are examples that kind of, um, that are exceptions that prove the rule. Um, and I think a few of them, uh, so what I wanted to just mention on this slide, the reason I've got Cyber Agent up there is because if you look at the, um, essentially it's been a fairly sort of lockdown market. You've had Hakahoda at number two now for a long time. Not much has changed. The biggest sort of, the biggest um, entrant into this market, and it wasn't in that slide because they're not defined as a media agency, but they, actually they are a media. They're just like Dentsu, they sell on, except they sell online media. They don't define themselves an agency, but Cyber Agent are now number two in the market, and they're catching up. They're bigger than Hakuhodo. And how have they done it? They've done it through talent. What they did is they, they basically hired a few people from um, the, the sort of uh, talent agency world and got them you know, spraying Bollinger around the uh, celebrity management world and basically did all these deals that brought the, t the talent from the old world, from the TV and from the traditional media, into their world as um, celebrity bloggers on Amoeba. And then all their fans came with them. And then all of a sudden, it was the coolest thing to be on Amoeba. And all of a sudden, Amoeba was selling like billions in ad revenue. And they did it by bringing the talent into their world. And, and so, in a way, they beat, they beat uh, Dentsu at their own game for digital. And that's, you know, they, they, Dentsu could have done that, they didn't. Um, Amoeba saw the opportunity. But it's really, for me, the, you know, the biggest sort of change in this market has been the emergence of Amoeba as a serious media vendor. And it's, they did it through, through getting access to, selling access to celebrities, essentially. So that's why, you know, I think it's a really celebrity-driven market. Much more so, so than the UK. Um, I think in America, because of the scales of the, of the, the market, seems maybe similar. But there are exceptions that I think prove the rule. I, this is on the left. This is the Eamon series, which I'm sure we're all, you know, all familiar with. It's still going. Um, 
and then on the right, the, the, the white plan series. And I think what these do really well, they're not so conceptual, but they, they set up, essentially you have characters, they have strong characterization, and there's a, there's a story arc that goes through to, throughout time that, that evolves, and the characters evolve, and the stories evolve. So it's a, it's a, a little bit of a soap opera in the, in the commercials. And, you know, I, I don't, these didn't, I don't think, I don't think these emerged from a Western planning sort of thought process. I just think they emerged from some very talented creators thinking about how they can, how they can communicate with their target audience. And, that, you know, so absolutely there is the talent here to do it. Um, but there's not, I think, the process to, to turn it into a model that can be replicated. I'm just going to show you a, a very, a, a kind of current campaign for Lotto 7, which I think is, um, which, you know, I think is a really good example of setting up characters and telling a story. Um, I think some of you might be familiar with it. ロトセブンって知ってます知らないな最高4億円なんです興味ないキャリーオーバーならなんと最高8億円だお前の夢は金で買えるのかああかっこいいやばい何になりそうロトセブン最高8億円のチャンス so this, um, in this one, I'm sure you kind of get it, but he's, he's the junior and his, his boss, the, the butcher, um, he's, you know, he's like, why are you thinking of money buying the lotto ticket? You know, do, will your dreams be satisfied with money? Um, and he's, then he's walking along on the road thinking, God, oh, that's so cool. Wow, what a guy. And then he sees him buying a lottery ticket. <laughs> um, and this series evolves um, and... Um, there's a very funny scene where he's, uh, they're meeting some really important clients and rather than his, his business card, he pulls out the lotto ticket by mistake, this is the boss, and hands that over to the client. Um, and this is a shameful insult and it loses them the job and the, this, this contract. Um, and in the next episode, he gets fired in this sort of boardroom scene. Um, and it's, you know, so then the junior becomes the senior. The, actually, the boss gets fired and the junior becomes the, the butcher. Um, and then in the most recent ones, the company gets acquired by a multinational. The, the, bit, the division that he's leading gets totally dissolved, and the butcher is actually now with the company that's acquiring them. Um, and the, the sort of the concept is like, like the, the story, well, Hanashi ga kawaru, like this, the talk changes or things move on. There's always change. So I think if, what it does really well is, is sort of tap into anxieties about you know, the, in Japan and, you know, jobs for life don't exist anymore. If I pick the right company, what happens if I get, a, if it gets acquired by a foreign company, I can't speak English. It's actually, it's really playing off the sort of the social anxieties of the moment. Um, and, you know, if you, if you want to back rationalize this one, I think the insight is that, um, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no sort of uh, security anymore. There's no security anymore, but the lotto is always there. You've always got hope, and and the, and the butcher, the boss, um, you know, he's the set up as this really stiff traditional Japanese boss, but he has, you know, the lotto is his little secret, and and it kind of what it's trying to do, I think, is normalise the lotto. It's trying to make it acceptable, because in a world where there's no security, why wouldn't you have a flutter? And I think so. I think it's a brilliantly sort of conceived. Communication. I don't think it came out of the Western planning model, but it's some very smart people. It's actually, it's, a, it's an offshoot of Dentsu that often, I think they've got some brilliant talent there. So it can be done, but you really have to get the right people on it because I don't think there's a model there that's going to get design the right communications for your brand. So I'm going to try and um, wrap up in the next sort of five minutes. Um, the, there's a really sort of good question when you get into this of like, when we talk about building a brand, are we talking about the same thing as we are in the West? I think, you know, Koichi touched on this. Um, the one thing is that here you have the relationship between the product brands and the kind of corporate mother brands is quite different. So I worked quite a lot on Dove, which is more sort of, it, it's a very long standing, it's an institution as a brand in the West. But um, one of its problems here is it doesn't innovate fast enough. They can't R&D fast enough to get, you know, if they're up against Shiseido, which puts out a different... Uh, Shiseido are trying to go actually a bit more on the Western model, but they actually, you know, they, the Japanese brands innovate so fast 
And what the ads basically do is announce another product launch. Whereas what the, the Western brands are trying to do is, is build long-term brand, you know, loyalty, emotional. And, but they're doing this in this incredibly cut, cluttered, sort of fast-moving, sell, 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 here's a new product, news announcements type stuff, that it's, the, the, the culture clashes a bit. Um, and so what we actually talk about when we, did, when we you know, the, the Japanese corporate brands have been here for so long, everyone knows them anyway, and we don't, they don't need to be advertised or refreshed. So they invest the money in the product announcements. Um, that's particularly for FMCG. Lotto is obviously quite different from that, which is why they had an opportunity to make such a sort of an interesting, an interesting advert. But a lot of when we're talking about this area, what we mean by a brand is quite different. Um, also, I think the trade have a lot to answer for here. I think they, you know, they, they, they think in terms of uh, short-term sales. You know, and, and you, if you're going to buy... If you're going to buy, I don't know, what is it, 20 tarps on this, this time, then we'll give you this much shelf space. And, and what talent are you using, by the way? So really, the, the, you know, the, the, the channel here is, is not very educated about building brands, but a lot of the decisions... I mean, I've, I've been sat in meetings where ads get put on TV, 20 million gets put behind them, when basically the target is two people. <laughs> it's the two guys at the, re at the retailers, right? We, we, a few people know that scenario. I also think um, you know, there's the more cultural aspects where TV, I think TV plays a different role in people's lives here. If you look on British TV, like ev every, every other TV is some sort of show, it's like some dark reality sort of documentary or it's a horrible sort of uh, crime scene investigation drama and it's, oh my God, do I need more reality in my life? Whereas in Japan, it's all like, you know, it's escapism, it's, it's, it's slapstick humor, it's really sort of um, quite playful dramas. Um, and so TV is a culture here that's, that's much more escapist in nature, um, where it, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't really fly to do much conceptual stuff. Um, and I do think the audience is wired differently as well. I, don't think, I think they're, um, in the, they're, they're less, I think, um, likely to sort of respond to a conceptually interesting idea. I think, it, I think absolutely um, in terms of story, their ability to sort of latch onto story, recognize characters, I believe that's a universal, universal human trait. So anything like the examples we just showed, which set up good characterization, good narrative, plot, it's gonna work anywhere, provided you're playing, you know, the archetypes they can recognize. Um, and they're sort of, particularly if they're plugging into some sort of these cultural undertones. Um, but yeah, they are, you know, I think for that, on the other side, they're much more, um, aesthetically um, astute and you know have got much so more of an eye for detail I think there's that they are aesthetically you know take the beauty um, anything that's in this sort of beauty space for women here is incredibly you have to be incredibly t up to the sort of the month in terms of how you're talking the, the colors the tones you're using it's a very very sophisticated market aesthetically and that's I think a lot of the great work that gets done by agencies here is in that area rather than in the conceptual area Um, so does that mean that this Western model just doesn't work here? Well, you know, is it actually wrong as a, as a universal way of approaching solving communications problems? So I kind of, after I, I wrote this article, um, it actually was kind of inspired by a conversation I had with Jeremy, who's, who's the sort of a sage in the, in the industry back in the UK, when I went back there in June. Um, and I had a bit of a dialogue with him, and he said, I, I should read it out because I think he's much more eloquent than I am, um, an extremely important part of the JWT approach, this was the one that invented this model back in the 60s, was the insistence that since all advertising sets out to achieve responses, and since only responses are measured, all communications objectives should be set not in terms of the input propositions, which if actually that's how I defined it incorrectly at the start of this presentation, but in terms of the desired responses, specifically from the senses and reasoning and emotions. So in other words, what you design for in that process, that process is, how is how people respond to it, not what, not you're, trying what you're trying to say, what you're trying, what you're trying to make, make them think. think. And that's really, and that's really important, important because, because that does, that does it, it brings in this context, like yeah, because how people, how people respond to something is a very, very different, different context. context. Um, um, and, and, and just, it just so happens that TV such a consistent, consistent communication relation for so long, the context basically basically changed very much. So you haven't had to think about it very much. And those are crazy directors, directors that come over and apply that, that, that formula that they do at the start. They do that thinking that that is that funny model, but it's actually not. The 
planning model is actually a context aware. How, how do I design communication or interaction online to get people to where I want them to be emotionally in terms of how they think, um, rather than this is what we should say to them. And that's, very, that's really important. That's a, it, it, it flips it around. So I think it's not that the Western model is wrong. I think that it's been misapplied all this time. Um, and the, you know, it's because the assumption has been that this context is fairly consistent everywhere. We've forgotten about it. But we can't forget about it online because it's just staring us in the face every day. And so what I believe is, is the sort of formula for when you get down into all these other channels that you have to worry about now as a brand and, and, and be consistent in and, and say the same thing and tap into consumers in the same way, into their subconscious, is there something like this. So you have the same brand truth and the target insight, um, but then you sort of need the context opportunity. What, what is special about the context in which you're talking to them, that channel? Like, so if it's a line, you know, what, what's the opportunity for your brand to, to, have a li to make a line gallery, um, a stamp gallery? What's the context for you know, Facebook where there's your, your peers may see whether you've liked this ad or not? So that's, I think, the, the, this combination of those three creates this user experience concept. And that's, that's the leap, that, a strategic leap that has to be made. And then there's a creative leap, which gets you to this, the, the, and it's actually a, a technical one as now, because you can make apps which are part of the experience. So it's a, this kind of um, creative and technical development leap that needs to be made. And in terms of team building, and we maybe can talk about it afterwards, but you actually need to bring in far more dive different types of skill sets into this, into this conversation, into this process, than you would traditionally. You need actually to have ac experts around the table from quite different disciplines. You know, if you're having a content, uh, content strategy discussion, you actually need an SEO expert in that room, not just someone who likes you know, a designer and a copywriter and a strategist. You need someone from SEO. Um, you need, you know, if you're doing, if you're doing video, you need to actually um, have a performance media expert, like understanding what's the opportunity um, on on YouTube. I mean, one of the interesting sort of things that we've played with recently is, you know, on YouTube, it, there's a there's a skip button after like four seconds, right, with the pre-rolls. What could you say in that first four seconds? Does not to get people to stop. What about a sort of reverse psychology? You say. You know, if you're not interested in, in, you know, really cheap but very expensive, you know, something, something, then please press skip now. And sort of do playing, playing with the opportunities that are inherent in, in, this, uh, in the media that only an expert in that media would sort of be aware of. And you need to get that kind of uh, insight into this, into this communication uh, planning. Um, so one example I think that we've done recently, which is kind of... Very different from the TV ad we will watch. This is um, a campaign for the British, uh, British Council study abroad. So basically, we're trying to persuade um, Japanese students who are kind of, you know, they've traveled less than their parents, this generation, and they're quite ang anxious about going to England or going to Britain and on their own, um, particularly because the food's so mazui, as we all know, um, <laughs> or get told constantly. Um, and so what we, what we did here, this is a good example of the social graph era, because we, we suck in their interest profile from Facebook's social graph, and then on the fly create a virtual um, timeline, show them what their timeline could look like after they've been to England and had all these experiences, which are part of this Ryugaku program. And so if you sort of reverse engineer that idea, you know, the insight is the anxiety not being able to sort of imagine what it's like to go to England on your own and, and actually have a good time. The opportunity with the channel is actually to use the social graph to grab insights about who, what they're interested in. So for instance, if they're, if they're interested in football, then you can include visit, you know, going to Chelsea to watch a football game as part, of the, as part of the experience, and then that appears on their timeline. And, so, and then the, sort of the creative leap is the creative idea, the leap to that creative idea is what if, and this is again a different way of thinking about story, um, but what if they, we could help them imagine the story of their experience going to England as a, as a virtual timeline? This is what it, it could make. I think that, that's a really important um, point about how to design communications is not to close, not to tie all the knots in, on behalf of the, the receiver, 
Um, there's a brilliant quote by Arthur Kersler that says, the artist rules his subject by turning them into accomplices. And so that goes with the same with the TV ad. We, we kind of love that TV ad because we all know the sort of person they are because they've played off these sort of archetypes as well. In this case, we're not, we, we can't actually say too much about what their experiences are like, but we leave in, they can look at that timeline and imagine, combine what they were thinking or they're hoping about what they could get from that with, with actually sort of tangible examples of experiences they could have. And between that, we closed them, and it was, a, you know, I think for some of those reasons, a very successful campaign. But we needed to think about the specific context that Facebook is and the opportunities that allowed us to, to take people on that little journey. So I think that's, um, that's all I'm going to try and cover. I think there's, I probably promised I'd answer more questions um, in, in the, uh, the, int the introduction to this. Um, do, if, if there's anything that you were really wanting to, to hear, do ask me now. I'm, I'm quite happy to be put on the spot. Um, or, um, although a little bit terrified. Um, but if you, as, as Coach, you mentioned, I do shoot from the hip um, when I'm writing on jameshollow.com and please do follow me on Twitter if you're a Twitter user because I post stuff up there as well. So questions, yeah, please fire away. Yeah, on this stick here. Hi, I'm Sarah, I do PR for Toys R Us. Um, my question is from an agency perspective about getting these campaigns and the creative ideas approved um, on the client side. If it's a you know a Japanese company versus a multi a foreign multinational, what the decision the differences in the decision making process are, mm -hmm. and um, the differences in terms of what level of person would authorize the campaign to go ahead and how the differences in, you know, concept versus aesthetics and things like that affect that process. Right. It's, it's you know, the, it's really dependent on the culture and how sort of sophisticated it is and factors like how, how influential the channel are in deciding it. You know, I've talked to lots of people um, who work in this industry from Western agencies and, and they just bemoan the sort of the obsession with talent, you know. Basically, oh, who's in it? oh, no, we don't like them, versus, oh, them, great. That's really good. And, and so that for very little sort of rational justification, things kind of get accepted or not. Um, I think there's, you know, there is a lot of rational stuff to be built around talent selection, and I'm, I don't at all think it's, um, you know, it's, all talent is, is wrong. It's not at all. Um, and actually online, it's very interesting because we can negate the need for talent using, so, you know, social credibility, um, there are other work ways to build credibility um, on digital, but in terms of um, you know getting the sign-off process, it, it, I really think it depends on how much they sort of how much uh, of an appetite there is for the rational explanations. But I think that you, if you're looking for an ag a Japanese agency, you're committed to work with them because of the access to media, and they basically th you know often throw in the creative bit for free compared to you know <laughs> it's ha often hard to say no to, right? Then tell them how you want to work. You know, give them a slide deck that says these are the this is this is the logic you have to fill in because if you don't put it in these terms, like it doesn't, it can't it can't get processed by my organisation. Um, and I've been on those calls with with head office back in the US where you're trying to explain why this you know execution is actually brilliant for Japan even though they, there isn't a rational explanation for it. Um, and sometimes you're sort of, you know, you can uh, just sort of claiming what Japan's really unique is, and, and it and is, can, can be enough, but usually it isn't. So I, I, I mean, I do think you need rational explanations. I do also think, I mean, I have two more points on that. Um, I think Japanese marketing departments have kind of got what they've deserved in terms of agencies, because they, they use Dentsu as a bragging right, and they use talent as a bragging right. Um, they'll say, you know, basically, we're using Dentsu. They're, they're useless, and they're so expensive. <laughs> and I'm just there going, what? <laughs> you, know they're, you know they're not what you need, and they're expensive, but you'll still sort of think that's, that's funny. And it's, it's because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bragging right. And, and I think it's, it's because it's this part of it. It's a high-context society, the marketing departments. You know, there hasn't been that much external competition. The domestic brands have basically had it mostly their way for a long time. And it's like they're all kind of part of the same clique, Dentsu domestic agency clique. And therefore, you know, which, which talent did we buy this time? 
So they're just playing into the Dentsu game of, selling, of basically auctioning talent off to the highest bidder. Um, so I would say, you know, make them, make them work in how, how you need them to work in order to get the, the sort of explanations. And they, might be, they actually might be very good at it because I've worked, you know, with lots of these agencies and the people themselves are often really talented and they often have the data as well. They, you know, the market department is actually, you know, it's often full of t really smart planners filled with data, but they get squashed by the creative egos, right? And they don't actually get to sort of put the, the strategy or the insight into, this, into the, the strategic thinking. So um, I think there's, I think it's kind of, you have to, on, as a Western brands, trying to get what we need from the Japanese agencies, it's some training involved and, and sort of direction. But it, you might find that it can work. Um, how do you personally define growth hacking and how does it apply specifically to the Japanese market? Oh, okay. Th who's heard of growth hacking? Obviously you, okay. <laughs> so um, I'll just give a bit of background. Growth hacking is a meme that came out of Silicon Valley, I think about, starting about five years ago. And um, essentially what you've got in Sil Silicon Valley is an engine for, for web-based business models, for new web-based business models. It just churns them out, throws them at people and see, see what sticks. And, and sort of in that world, the idea is you, how quickly can you, can you grow your user base? Um, so I think a sort of pragmatic definition of uh, growth hacking is, what, you know, basically no rules, what's the quickest way to, to grow my user base? And because these, these are machines that are basically plugged into this massive evolving machine called the internet, um, it, you, you, it's not really sufficient to come at it from a marketing communications point of view. You actually need people to understand the, te the, the technology platforms and how your business can be wired into um, the, the opportunities to grow. And so the growth, I think the growth hacking actually, it started off as the definition of a, of a new role in these startup companies called the growth hacker. And the growth hacker typically was a developer who could basically play with code and hack into um, different platforms to allow the, the company to grow there, um, who was the sort of hub of a growth team, which then included the head of PR, the head of like communi you know communications marketing. So I think I I like to I think the easiest way to sort of get a grip on that on growth hacking to answer your question is actually as the growth hacker, as the leader of this inter this cross disciplinary tool that really has to bring lots of different skill sets to bear in order to solve complex problems. And that's really a model that we apply as well. You know, essentially we, we create value, new original value. If I can get, say, four or five different skill sets sitting around a room attacking a, a complex problem that not any one of them could solve on their own. That's, you know, and that never happens in our client organizations. I don't know, are there any other agencies that do it? Because it's, it's so hard, it seems so hard to do. Often they're in other separate buildings, right? You know, you have the search guys over here and you have the, the content people over here. And it's like, how can you separate search and content? It's crazy, but they, they'd never talk to each other. So really, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's a team model. If you can get different disciplines sitting around a, in, around a table with the right, attacking the right problem, they can come up with an original solution that no one's ever thought of that's you know, specific to that that context. So I think that's what growth hacking's kind of in its purest form about. And we as agencies and brands can um, can look at that and copy it in terms of a team model. But I think it really only applies to purely web-based, you know, that, that term really only applies to truly web-based models, which oft, always, you know, often we aren't. Um, but I think we can learn from it. Does that answer your question? Developing versus in Silicon Valley. Um, I mean, so I, I ran a program called Growth Hacking Japan University to try and bring this kind of thinking and approach to kind of you know forget form, just look at the end result, and you know it basically be accept that you're going to accept the sort of uh, the the tyranny of a single metric as your as your sort of defining your. Um, success and, and then approach it from these problems and then look at okay how can you join content with search up better how can you have a really how can you basically get free traffic from SEO by having a really switched on content strategy how can you 
bring, um, you know, the classic example of growth hacking was um, Airbnb hacking into Craigslist. So Craigslist, America's biggest listing platform, Airbnb, people who want to basically rent out their apartments. Uh, uh, Craigslist did not have a, um, uh, a pl an, uh, an ability, they didn't set up um, a way for third parties to tap into their user base. Um, but Craigslist hacked it, basically, and allowed people on, sorry, Airbnb hacked it and allowed people who wanted to rent their apartments to list them on Craigslist. And it brought them, like, basically took them from having zero visibility to huge visibility through essentially a, a, a kind of an illegal and that it was against Craigslist regulations to do it. So that's a, that was a classic example of how putting a developer in the, in the sort of growth team was transformative. Um, so have Japanese companies switched onto that? On, on, on the web they have, absolutely. And so I was doing these lectures, I did a seven week lecture course twice to essentially Japanese founders in Japanese about these Silicon Valley techniques. And they, they absorbed it all and, and went off and started applying it. Um, but in term, more sort of generally towards this audience, no, it's abs I mean, most people, I don't think have heard of it. Um, and I don't think, I think there's sort of probably there's lower hanging fruit on online, where, uh, just how to use digital to grow their brands that you know I would encourage them to think about first. And typically in Japan, still, the web is looked at as an opportunity to extend the reach of an of a of a campaign tagline designed for traditional channels, which is already wrong. You know, basically that means you can do banner ads. That's so. You know, most most of you will be brought. You know, sort of, oh yeah, we do digital, we do digital, of course we do, we're really good. But it's, they'll, they'll make the idea for TV and print, and then, then they'll say, look, and now it goes all across digital. But that doesn't mean that a, a kind of an idea or that process has been through for the digital channels. And so it ends up as a banner, you know, banner ads are not worthless, but there's an awful lot more value that could be gained through a sort of a, a, digi a native to digital approach. One more question. Sorry, on this side of the room. Hi, uh, Dan Lockman from Edelman. Um, you talked a lot about story and narrative and telling in Japan, but obviously we're seeing a lot more in terms of brands listening uh, globally uh, and enabling consumers to voice their opinions or be involved in a debate around a brand. So Dove campaign for real beauty, for example. Um, how do you see that developing in Japan? Do you think that that's something that will develop? We've not seen much luck with it so far um, as, a, as a trend, but with online and the point that you made in, in the last section of your answer for that, for the last gentleman's question, um, you know, if online is the starting point for a campaign, then it needs to be more user um, connected rather than telling. Uh, which you would see in a above the line campaign what are, what are your thoughts in Japan for that I think um so go the first point about listening and what's the value of listening to brands so I, I think before you get to the point of having a conversation, I think listening is important to topicality basically being on topic so if, if let's say you're a beauty brand um, and you need to essentially you, you need to be building relevance out there where there are lots of you know beauty sensitive eyeballs reading stuff looking at pictures online right to get rudimentary about it if you're not really current with what you're talking about and the topics you're creating content around and the aesthetics of your visual communications you're going to look basically like last year's look which is not the place to be for a beauty brand so listening i think is about essentially being sensitive to context which evolves, re you know, in, in that sense, in beauty, aesthetically, but also in terms of topics. So that, and that moves on really quickly. Um, it's a very sort of trend-driven market. Um, lots of, you know, people are pretty information hungry. They don't really have much of a pushback when they get, to, you know, for too much information. So it, you need, I think it's really important for brands here um, to, be, to be listening, to be on topic, to be, you know, essentially understand what is the, the zeitgeist and to be part of that and contributing to it, because that equals relevance. You know, I think the first rule of professionals like yourself, you, brand, you need to be making your brand relevant. Um, 
in terms of sort of um, dialogue, are brands opening up channels to have two-way conversations with consumers? Less so, I'd say, here than in America. Um, in particular, you know, I think the UK, America, Europe, they are you know, years ahead. Why is that? Um, I think there is, um, it's risk aversion would be one, I think, um, that it's, it's a sort of a liability channel, um, which doesn't, if it doesn't need to be opened up, why would we? Um, I think, you know, in some ways, wh where does risk aversion come from in Japan? In some ways, it, it, we're kind of living in an era that's, that's suffering from the successes, the extreme successes of the previous era, where you had so many very strong Japanese brands really dominating the domestic market, pretty much keeping the foreign competitors out, pretty much, or keeping them at, you know, at, at the scale they find acceptable. Um, and so there hasn't been much of a sort of pressure on them to, to innovate and try and find competitive advantage, like there is in America. Um, so, you know, an example would be, um, was it Oreos in the Super Bowl set up a um, sort of a, they got essentially the people in the room that could sign off an ad idea in 30 seconds in a room, in a kind of war room with the top people from the agency. And I think it was the lights went out and, and so in the, there was a blackout, right? And then, so they put something out on social media. Um, do you want to remind me what it is? Dunk in the dark, thank you. So, never mind. so that's a great example of, of empowering people downstream. Well, I mean, there's the, guy, the people in the room, but basically empowering a sort of, you know, a context and looking at a, at a, at a context-based opportunity, a channel opportunity that might happen and getting really reactive about it. So we talk a lot about how can we be more reactive. And our problem is not us, it's the, it's the people we work with because they're organizationally, they don't handle it. But I mean, to be honest, before that, most of the issues you know, we have is how, how, do, you, how do you get um, 250 social media bits of content through the legal check this <laughs> one? It's on that level. We're struggling, right? You know, how do you get, that? that's more the problem. So, you know, everything has to go through legal. Let's set up some rules that the legal can be happy with and, and then we go through that. So that's the sort of level of education I think Japan's at. Maybe what you're talking about will, will be the next phase, I hope so. Thank you very much for your questions, everyone. That was really fun.